Um, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce to you today one of our treasured colleagues here at the center, Scott Brown. Uh, Scott Brown is an assistant professor. I'm sorry, that's not actually true. I mean, you're an associate professor now. Associate professor in African American Studies and History here at UCLA. He is author of Fighting for Us, Malanga Branga, The Us Organization, and Black Cultural Nationalism. He is currently researching the history and social politics of funk music in southern Ohio. Today's talk is entitled, Pedagogy of the Funk, Teachers, Students, and Desegregation in Dayton, Ohio. Scott Brown. Thank you, Darnell. I don't know if July 1st is the official date or what, uh, we'll, but we'll I'll, push take, it a little. We'll I'll push take it. the promotion for you are willing to give it to me. Uh, it's a pleasure to share with you um, some very preliminary uh, thoughts that I'm having uh, about a new um, research uh, topic of mine uh, that I'm interested in, uh, and that is really the um, social politics of punk music, and what I have uh, come to conclude is an epicenter of African American uh, culture, uh, Dayton, Ohio. So let me start with that proposition, because uh, usually when we think about you know, African American culture and urban locale prominent uh, in the production of culture, it's difficult to conceive uh, of a mid-sized uh, Midwestern city, Dayton, Ohio, as a place um, worthy to be set uh, aside with uh, beside, uh, New York, Chicago, uh, Memphis, um, St. Louis, Detroit, New Orleans, etc. And usually when I discuss my interest in Dayton and funk music, I'm usually accused of being from Dayton or from Ohio. It's usually the first question, well, are you from somewhere over there? Uh, I'm actually not. I'm from Rochester, New York, but it is um, a city very much like uh, Dayton, Ohio. Mid-sized, um, largely working class city with a very um, large proportion uh, of African Americans in its population. Um, so this uh, just discussion I'd like to have uh, will cover the elements of what I think, or at least some of the key institutions in what I think is a pedagogy of funk. And when I'm talking about pedagogy, I'm talking about a community pedagogy in which there are institutions and social networks that end up reinforcing uh, music education and music performance at a special moment in history that I'd like to talk about. Um, it's a community-driven pedagogy sustained, as I said, by a host of networks between uh, teachers, students, and the uh, public sphere. While initial studies of funk music and African-American culture have uh, noted the importance of Dayton, recent studies are only beginning to place the genre uh, in the context of local uh, uh, urban uh, history and politics. Portia Maltzby's um, article, a uh, very important article, Funk Music and Expression of Black Life in Dayton, Ohio, and the African American uh, Metropolis, situates Dayton Funk in the history of the city's status as a promised land of sorts for waves of black southern migrants in the 20th century and opens the door for further inquiry into the relationship between um, uh, this music and the social politics of the day. Funk, um, loosely defined as a fusion of jazz, rhythm and blues, and rock, was a national trend in African music, American music during the mid-1970s through the early 80s, with regionally specific styles and forms of uh, expression. So we're not talking about a homogeneous uh, form of music, but one that has very much, as is the case with um, black vernacular and its relationship to hip-hop. There are very clear regional uh, distinctive, distinctions in hip-hop, right? We have, you know, the Dirty South and then subsets in that. New Orleans, uh, Atlanta, right? Then you go to the Midwest uh, with uh, STL. And then so funk actually was not different in that respect. A disproportionately, however, large number of commercially successful funk bands came from Dayton uh, during the 1970s. In the early 80s, a period in which African Americans comprised over one third uh, of a population of approximately 200,000 
Now, I'm going to show, play some samples because what happens is, and this is maybe a complex I've had from talking about this, I don't really think people believe me. So, uh, as is the case when I'm teaching uh, in the class and I'm talking about some radical movement and the students are all tense, I should sort of have to show a documentary to get them to really believe it. I think I'll do something similar here in terms of playing the songs and hopefully you'll recognize them either in the original form or through the form in which they appear today, which is more in a sample. Uh, All right, let's see if you recognize this song. by Snoop this song. Watching. Watching you. Do I know the name of that group? Slave. Slave. Alright, I'm going to try another one here. How about this song? Chrysler, 
and the Wright-Patterson uh, Air Force Base and a number of uh, service sector uh, and small businesses. West Dayton's economic viability supported a rich nightlife with numerous bars, clubs, and after-hours establishments. Streetwise tales drawn from experiences in places like the Astro House, Fat Daddies, uh, and the Ebony Club frequently surfaced in the lyrical content of Dayton's first nationally renowned punk band, the Ohio Players. Um, and Ohio Players, of course, are a lot of the themes in their music are related to street life, um, so they got popularized, uh, and even some of the more uh, unsavory aspects of street life. Um, it's like the song Skin Tight. I don't know if you've taken the time, you are bad, bad missus and them skin tight britches, baby about to bust some stitches, you know. Um, Driving, running folks in ditches, all right? Um, oh, I forget the line. Um, cash money all the time, something like that, you know. Uh, but you get the point. It's about prostitution. Uh, while the group did not achieve commercial success until the early 1970s, Ohio players were experienced jazz and rhythm and music, blues musicians known uh, during the early 1960s as the Untouchables. And they were, were actually session musicians um, for Jackie Wilson and the Falcons. So there is certainly um, a black rhythm and blues, jazz uh, tradition in Dayton that precedes the funk explosion. The Ohio players were a generation apart from the numerous local funk artists that followed them, comprised of younger musicians. And this is really the uh, focus of the study, is not so much the Ohio players per se, but their protégés. Slave, another group called Aura, Lakeside, Steve Arrington's Hall of Fame, Sun, Heatwave, Faso, Roger Troutman, Zap, Shirley Murdoch, New Horizons, another group called Dayton, Shadow, Sly Slick and the Wicked, Overnight Low, Hot Number, and many others. Many of these bands were recent high school graduates in the early 1970s and relatively new as professional musicians, having received formal and informal music training uh, in Dayton's public schools and social networks with older musicians. Dayton's recording artists represented a mere fraction of participants in deeply embedded local funk music culture, buttressed by an array of interlocking public sphere institutions. Now, I'd like to talk about the institution that I see as really one of the major pillars in this local music culture, and that is uh, the high schools. Uh, Dayton's high schools, um, actually only until the last few years um, had undergone a uh, desegregation order uh, and had busing, but Dayton's black schools um, go back to a much earlier period. Black high schools uh, and um, elementary schools were a centerpiece in the rise of Dayton funk. Dunbar High School was established in 1923 as the result of African-American protests of segregation and mistreatment of black students at predominantly white schools. Um, uh, one school in particular, which became all black later on, Roosevelt even had uh, you know, separate swimming pools. So they were uh, kind of often uh, protesting the dehumanizing segregation within predominantly white schools and had a preference for it. So it sort of plays with the idea of all black schools, some of whom are born out of um, community notions of self-determination and anti-racist politics. By the 1950s, as a result of the out-migration of whites, Roosevelt and Roth High Schools located in West Dayton became virtually all black schools. In addition, uh, Jefferson High School located in the Jefferson Township, a predominantly black suburb, followed the same pattern. Blacks in Dayton generally regarded their schools as a central facet of community cohesion. Uh, teachers and school administrators were not merely prominent in their respective professional positions, but often organic leaders. Uh, in churches, uh, civic organizations, uh, and heavily involved in the music culture. And I look back at this period and I think about uh, the years when I worked as a uh, public school teacher. Uh, and we had all of these theories about how the new American teacher is supposed to look, supposed to be civically engaged, supposed to transgress all these boundaries of authority. And I say, wow, when I look at this study, how, how much that theorizing could have been enhanced if it had been drawn from so many of the cases that I've seen uh, in this study of African-American uh, teachers. 
So what are the links between black schools and the music that you heard earlier? Roosevelt High School, Dunbar High School, Roth and Jefferson High Schools all had extensive music programs and in most cases required courses in music theory as prerequisites for participation in intramural choirs and marching bands. Now these are all black schools. As a result, most funk musicians in Dayton were able to read music during their high school years. Uh, when I spent time with members of Lakeside, all of those musicians could read music. Uh, Junie Morrison, who was the keyboard player uh, for the Ohio Players and then went on to play with Funkadelic, you can hear his genius in masterpieces like Knee Deep, uh, was a real virtuoso uh, of sorts, uh, among uh, seen as such by his peers. For instance, James Diamond Williams, drummer of the Ohio Players, began playing drums at nine years old, and the schools were the primary outlet for his instruction and performance opportunities. He attended Roosevelt High School, as did a number of others from the Ohio Players, and was captain of its drum uh, and uh, bugle corps. After graduating, he went on to study music uh, and serve as drum corps captain at Kentucky State University. Um, and he claims that he um, got into it with some of the um, folks from the South who were at Kentucky State who didn't like the idea of their drum captain being from, you know, uh, from up north, being from Dayton. And so he has a story about him being run out of Kentucky State and ends up uh, finishing at um, University of Dayton. His style of drumming in the Ohio Players is notably marked by rapid drum rolls and time signature changes undoubtedly anchored in his music training. And I'll give you an example of this. Listen to the drumming um, at the of uh, a very popular Ohio Players ballad. I think it will make the point for you. changes uh, were very much a part of um, Diamond's approach to drumming. William Juni Morrison, the first keyboard player of the Ohio Players, who incidentally went on to play with Parliament Funkadelic, along with Marvin Pierce, trumpet uh, trombonist, both played in Roosevelt's marching band. Morrison, a uh, multi-instrumentalist, as I said earlier, joined the Ohio Players just after graduating from high school, high school. Other former members recount that he was quite skillful in reading and writing music upon joining. Thomas Lockett of Slave uh, began playing clarinet uh, in the eighth grade, uh, and he switched to saxophone during his freshman year at Rock High School uh, and also played uh, with its marching band. Slave's guitarist, uh, Danny Webster, also attended Roth and studied uh, music theory there. In a fascinating manner, participation in school marching bands and choirs in Dayton supported the proliferation of student-led funk bands. Some funk groups were seen as representatives of specific schools in Dayton. For instance, members of Slave and Lakeside went to Roth High School. Members of uh, Sun and um, uh, the uh, precursors to a group called Dayton, uh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, went to uh, the All Black High School, Jefferson Township High School, um, and also the group Faso came to me. The shifting personnel of other bands, such as Overnight Low, and of uh, the only one all-women's group that I could find called Hot Number, uh, transcended uh, neighborhood and school affiliation. Now, what's fascinating in this process is the role that black teachers would play in cultivating a distinctive competitive ethos in Dayton Funk that centered on showmanship, live performances, um, and showmanship in live performance. And if you know anything about Dayton, some of the bands that I talked about, these are among the very best show bands uh, that the genre has produced. Of course, the Ohio Players, but even the younger groups, especially Lakeside, that makes the kind of Motown-centered choreography of lead singers along with the um, 
very flamboyant stage performances of musicians. So they're self-contained bands, but then extend to the musicians the same kind of theatrical performance dimension. So if you look at groups like Lakeside at their height, everybody in the group stepped. So you have the lead singers that stepped, but also bass players stepped, even the drummer, if he could motion in the way that the rest of the group could, um, he would. And that grows out of this distinctive uh, live music culture and competitive ethos that I like to talk about. To give you more specifics within this uh, trend, Clarence Spencer was well, a music teacher and choir director at Roosevelt. He not only trained a significant number of musicians uh, from 1963 through 1975, but also regularly organized talent shows featuring rival funk bands. And uh, these talent shows would become a crucial source of funding uh, for school marching bands and choirs, uh, and very much central to this competitive battle of the bands ethos in Dayton. Uh, so one downside of the all-black schools is that um, they were never adequately funded. And what the talent shows would serve as a venue to raise money for the music programs. So. Many of Spencer's students uh, that went to Roosevelt uh, would perform in talent shows in which bands from other schools would compete. And the memories of people that I've interviewed thus far of how important those talent shows were. They, were, they attracted more people in many cases than uh, bands who were recording artists at the time that would come through the area. Um, and so, uh, I have a lot of, uh, sort of uh, testimonies about the different venues um, that one finds this competitive ethos, not only in talent shows, but also in what was called the show wagon variety show. I don't know if you can remember the period in the 70s if you went out to the park and they had bands, they had these mobile stages uh, that were on trucks and, um, you know, a group of people could crowd up on top you know, and perform, but it was still a very tight um, and restricted space. The Show Wagon Variety Show was um, uh, a big venue for com competition. Um, the keyboard player for Faso Heat Wave and then eventually the da jazz band, Keith Harrison, uh, remembers uh, and still has to this day uh, the trophy that his band acquired after winning a competition at the Show Wagon Variety Show. The owner of a nightclub uh, called the Tahiti Club in West Dayton uh, would allow school <coughs> school age members of bands to perform there on special nights designated for teenagers. Local local uh, roller skating halls uh, such as the Uber Skating Rink and Mayor Skating Rink followed suit by featuring multiple bands on designated evenings. Many younger musicians played alongside older ones in nightclubs and settings geared toward adult audiences. The training of younger musicians that younger musicians received in, in school and talent shows was complemented by, in some cases, secondary too, a powerful tradition of uh, intergenerational mentoring among musicians. Most funk bands that had recording contracts with major labels uh, in the mid to late 70s owe their national exposure to the Ohio players, who from 74 to 77 produced a string of gold-selling albums and two number one pop chart singles, Fire and Love Roller Coaster. Uh, that would extend uh, to other spaces in the black uh, public sphere, their popularity. And uh, their popularity would lend itself to the mentoring of uh, some of the members of the uh, other groups that I mentioned, for instance, uh, Slaves founder Steve Washington was a younger cousin of the trumpet player in Ohio players um, uh, named Pee Wee. At least that's his uh, stage name. Um, so there's a lot of mentoring also that's going on uh, in an informal kind of way between musicians. I think I may have had my uh, pages out of order here, so I'll go on. Members of the Ohio players taught and cultivated many of the uh, Southern Ohio funk bands that emerged in the late 70s. Bassist Marshall Jones gave lessons uh, to William Bootsy Collins, uh, who was from Cincinnati, but when 
Bootsy reflects on his early music uh, phase, talks about how much he had to keep driving over to Dayton. Um, and guitarist uh, Leroy Sugarfoot Bonner uh, inspired prodigy multi-instrumentalist Roger Troutman, who actually lived just outside of Dayton in a town called Hamilton. So you know, there's an argument to be made. Is Hamilton greater Dayton uh, or greater Cincinnati? Um, and so there's a debate about uh, to the extent to which Dayton is just a dominant epicenter among many uh, in Ohio. I'm starting with Dayton, though, but open to certainly changing my view uh, on these things. Roger uh, played heavily by ear and also had some formal music uh, education uh, and uh, spent time at uh, the Conservatory of Music uh, in Cincinnati. Yet the Ohio players were serving in a broader context of a community pedagogy in which older musicians and family members were directly involved in mentoring musician, musicians. Sean Sandridge, guitarist uh, of a group known as the Imperials, it went, went on eventually to record with the band's son in the late 1970s. His father, Dale Sandridge, managed the Imperials. Ohio State Representative Lloyd Lewis Jr. recalled that Dale, quote, bought a van and put a band together and helped the kids buy instruments. And he says, now we're talking 14, 15 years old, and he took them everywhere to play in his van. Mr. Sanders' ability to assist in that manner testified to the economic stability and relative prosperity of the black working class uh, in Dayton from the 1940s to the early 1970s. And in the 70s is a period, it's ironic that it's a period in which many of these bands get their initial uh, recording contracts in the late 70s, but it's also a period in which a lot of the structures that led to their music instruction and led to uh, this distinctive music culture were also being undermined. Economically and politically, Mr. Sand. Oh, Roger Troutman also recounted that his father uh, worked as a truck driver uh, and uh, worked also the evening shift at a paper mill. Um, also assisted uh, and took on management of uh, the band that he and his brothers were in. Another very fascinating uh, person in this story who I'd like to learn a lot more about. Her name is Eula Carter. Um, and she's the mother of the Carter brothers, who formed the bulk of the group Slave. Um, she taught in schools, um, taught, uh, interestingly enough, not music, but social studies, and was very active in the church. But she was very much interested in this idea of music training uh, as a basis for not only keeping the kids out of trouble, but part of this idea of what being cultured was. All of her kids could play piano. Um, uh, all of her six children uh, were instrument musically inclined. Their gender issue, gender issues here, though, that I'm, I'm interested in, and that is the extent of encouragement that uh, some of the uh, young men got as far as playing with the local bands. And then what I end up seeing is that uh, her daughter uh, ends up playing heavily in church, but doesn't really get into the local music scene. So it's. It's an interesting dynamic here about the gender aspect of uh, this ethos that I'm going to explore further as well. There's also a, a, a strong gender and male-centered bias in the mentoring of musicians. When I frequently asked uh, musicians who had sisters, well, why didn't your sister, who admittedly plays better, play better than most of these guys that you're talking about, they said, oh, no, we couldn't have we just didn't see that as something we would do, have a woman playing in this band. So the sense at which these bands also represented um, a kind of male-centered sensibility uh, of, uh, and a, a, a group uh, identifier. Gender and family support for young men uh, to work in live music arena, um, it would exclude women, and church would prevail as one of the few inclusive outlets of women musicians. And then there were, there were women musicians, in particular the all-women's band that I talked about, Hot Number, but they were usually seen like, I don't know if you remember a group um, called Climax, um, as, or even Taste of Honey when they first came out, sort of a novelty uh, act. Um, I'm going to move to raise some questions that I'm still working through. This uh, is really just the beginning of uh, a series of questions that I'm looking at and trying to explain the decline of uh, Dayton Funk. As I mentioned earlier, paradoxically, the 
period, a uh, very period in which numerous groups from Dayton acquired initial contracts with major uh, record labels, uh, record labels, uh, an essential pillar of the city's local punk music culture, West of the Black Schools, uh, was being dismantled. Dayton's public schools in the 1970s continued to mirror the racially separated residential demographic in the city and became an arena in the national debate over the scope of uh, the 1954 Brown v. Board decision. After several years of litigation at the lower court level, the United States Supreme Court ultimately granted, uh, in what is known as the Dayton II decision, federal judges the power to order vast desegregation plans and busing for an entire school system, as opposed to restricting them to areas designated as racially imbalanced. The 1970s court ordered desegregation plans in Dayton radically transformed uh, the African American community. In 1975, Roosevelt High School was abruptly closed due to what many, many suspect was the one directional nature of the view of integration, and that is Roosevelt High School, if it were to stay open, would mean that large numbers of white students would have to now move over, come over to West Dayton, uh, large and share space, large number of administrators would have to, et cetera, et cetera. So Roosevelt High School was closed. Uh, and both Dunbar uh, and Roth were, quote, integrated with large portions of its black students and faculty reassigned to predominantly white East Side schools. African American music teacher, teachers recall these events as having disrupted the school community based music tradition in Dayton. My search for answers uh, seeks to explain the decline of Dayton Funk as a local phenomenon will invariably lead to a consideration of the impact of desegregation policies on local music culture. And this is where you're getting into a very interesting but uh, I think um, dangerous ground. One is that we typically when we're talking about music, especially within the context of cultural studies, we don't usually talk about public policy as ever having an impact on, on music and culture in that kind of way. That there are actually, if, if so many other facets of, of life are affected by policy, why would we think music somehow be insulated from that? Um, and then the other sort of value-laden discourse on desegregation, uh, as opposed to looking at desegregation as a set of policies that can be assessed that are not uniformly, you know, uh, manifested in different locale. Desegregation in one place means something very different in another. Did the disciples of the Ohio players, the Slave, Lakeside, Roger, Basil, unlike their mentors, fall short of reproducing themselves with a new generation of funk artists in the 1980s? Beyond Southern Ohio, the funk genre was also losing popular ground in the 1980s, with Lakeside, Slave, and Roger Troutman uh, and uh, Zap enduring among a relatively small number of bands that continue to generate hit records for the first half of the decade. And this is not this is due to a lot of factors: the, the, the broader decline of funk uh, as hip hop soared to become a leading black music genre in the decades thereafter. It reintroduced funk through sampling to a new generation of listeners, most of whom conceivably unaware of how this music once colored the socio-cultural fabric of black communities throughout the United States. Funk in Dayton is a relatively short but fantastic voyage, sailing through complex teacher-student relationships and community mentoring in a period uh, marked by rapid change, high expectations, and shifting socio-political realities. Now I'll stop there and we can uh, have more dialogue. Yes, um, this is some great stuff. Uh, thanks again. Especially the music. It's hard to top that. This is an observation because I think that you mentioned the Dunbar High School. Mm -hmm. And you know, lots of black communities at Dunbar High School. Mm -hmm. but here, Dunbar was born and raised in Dayton, and, right. I, and that goes back to like 1890. Sure. And suggests that there's a certain black middle class presence mm -hmm. in Dayton. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering about the extent to which some of the 
the lineage of uh, expectations in terms of culture, expectations of the class, maybe even in terms of expectations in terms of a certain access to celebrity, uh, go back further than, mm -hmm. say, the, the, the 60s and 50s, maybe even mm -hmm. rooted in the late 19th like century. The 19th century. I, it does. I mean, and like Los Angeles, there is this distinction between the waves of African Americans that come uh, in the 19th century. Uh, late 30s and 40s, right, and then the uh, generation, the small but very class conscious uh, community that's there earlier. The bulk of uh, the uh, uh, musicians and family members that I've talked to are from the second wave um, and root their, at least their parents, root their musical sensibilities from really the South. Um, but I think you're right. There is, I mean, there, uh, Wilberforce is uh, right there. Central State is there. There's a, what, what I find interesting is the way in which the uh, notion of education and mobility would also be embraced so much by working class folk in Dayton. So there may be, you're absolutely right, older middle class sensibilities about education and mobility, but they seem to take hold in a larger socioeconomic uh, um, uh, sphere of the community than um, we sort of think about, um, you know, the blacks on the hill in Boston, as, Ma as Malcolm X talks about in, in, in Roxbury, right, and then the, the blacks down here who have totally, in his view, different, even a binary kind of relationship. What I found is a lot more fluidity um, and very um, open boundaries around this idea of going to school uh, and achievement. Also, the extent to which you know teachers were able to, for some of these uh, uh, youth, they were more involved with their teachers outside of the classroom than they were inside the classroom. That teacher may have meant more to them as a leader in a church or a manager of a band <coughs> in their daily lives than as a classroom teacher. So. I think you raised a point that something I have to really work out is how do I talk about class in this context? One thing I've think, seen thus far is it's, it's very complicated uh, and not marked by some of the more distinctive boundaries that I've seen like in texts like Our Kind and People, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It also overlaps with you know, color distinction, et cetera, et cetera. I haven't seen evidence of that. Uh, it seems very fluid. Uh, and also, it's, this is a period in a city that has such you know, relatively high wage working class folk that can afford purchase of instruments, that can afford at their height um, classes and music, you know, private instruction, etc. Okay. Is someone else supposed to? Oh, no. Okay. Yeah, I can right. My, uh, yeah. Um, good stuff, Scott. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, this argument parallels um, many of the arguments about the social cost of desegregation, mm -hmm. one of which was the professionalization of black teachers in primary and secondary schools. Uh, a lot of the uh, recent empirical work on this question shows quite clearly that desegregation, at least in the way in which it was implemented in the South, clearly led to a funneling off of the best black teachers from black schools to white schools, thereby uh, putting a serious damper on the, to the, on the degree to which black teachers came into the profession and on learning for, for, for black kids more generally. So, I think making the connections to the other kinds of costs that were involved in, in DSA that parallel the cost of music is an interesting question. But the other, the other thing to ask is, so if, if, if in fact this tradition of, 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 of learning in music, of mentoring, was so strong in Dayton, that you would have thought that there would have been other kinds of alternative forms of learning that would have emerged to take the absence of the lost musical programs yeah. from that. So why did that not occur? Why didn't the black? Yeah. I mean, one of the things you have to look yeah. at is that is that the form, right? I mean, a lot of these kids who uh, are being bused mm -hmm. right, are spending all their afternoons right. Right, yeah. on the bus yeah. and unable yeah. to yeah. to engage, yeah. even if there were mentors mm -hmm. back at Dayton and West Dayton that mm -hmm. would be willing right. to to continue that model of mm -hmm. musical development, right? So there's so not only you know, there's, there's, the, there's the policy, but there's also the, the particular form of intervention, yeah, which was yeah. busing, that had a whole set of costs on, you know, the extent to which they gained uh, other kinds of educational activities, physical sports, 
on all those things that were impacted as well. Absolutely, and there's also, uh, this is something that and I have my own sense of this, but I like to document, I have to do more of a quantitative aspect of looking at the training of the black teachers. Most people say we had in Roosevelt, I'm paraphrasing when I say we, as a black they told me we had at Roosevelt and Dunbar far more teachers who were PhDs than the white schools in East Dayton. So I also want to look at, you know, what happens to the quality of education, uh, in addition to, as you said, time lost uh, from busing. But also, it's ironic, and I think this answers part of your question as to why didn't other kind of social forms, uh, pedagogical forms emerge, is that desegregation hits uh, really when the economic downturn in Dayton also starts to reach its sharpest points when uh, deindustrialization hits. So there's that. So there are points at which some of this decline can be explained by the policy, but some of it also can be explained by just a loss of resources. And with DC, then you also have the outmigration uh, of whites in East Dayton. So that's why it becomes ironic. The reason why the busing program has come to an end in Dayton is because blacks in West Dayton were being bused all the way to East Dayton to another all black part of town. Um, so, uh, and that in part uh, is also coupled with the uh, economic downturn. So that's a question that I'm raising. I've asked a question to um, Steve Arrington of Slave. I said, well, why didn't you all do what your mentors did? That is, why couldn't you all produce another set of musicians inspired by what you're doing? He said, part of it was, didn't unlike Detroit, never developed a recording apparatus in Dayton. Uh, so we all have stories of jumping in the van and making it, driving out to LA. You know, whereas the Ohio players did most of the recording at first in Detroit at Westbound, which still gave them a close connection, proximity to Dayton. And then eventually also Chicago when they were with Mercury Records. Uh, so they're never really out of the Midwest as a visible kind of force in a way that Lakeside and then maybe, of course, you, uh, we, I don't know if you're familiar anymore with Solar Records. This interesting story in which uh, an L.A. Uh, black label really siphons off a lot of the Dayton funk and, and Ohio funk. Midnight Star is signed with uh, Solar Records. Lakeside is uh, Shalomar. Um, Shalomar's uh, lead singer is Howard from Akron, Howard Hewitt. He's from Akron, Ohio, which is another part of the story. Um, and J uh, James Ingram, right, is from Akron, Ohio, also. Uh, members of the group Switch, some of them are from. So there's a there's a much. Uh, what's that? Who? The bar. The bar. There's a much larger story here that uh, the deeper in you get, the further out you go, which I think is very appropriate for uh, just doing the topic of uh, funk. Yeah. Can I just push one point? Sure. It, and, I, and I don't want to dominate this. I'm sorry, but, oh, sure. but I think the question that you raise about funk declining more generally also impacting it. Right? I mean, you might want to think about reversing that question mm -hmm. and ask whether or not desegregation and its influence on funk actually led to the deceleration of funk, uh, funk's attractiveness nationwide. I mean, mm -hmm. that's a re reverse question. I mean, mm -hmm. To the extent that you could keep re re reifying these terrific bands. Mm -hmm. Right. If you still had that production factory kicking out, you know, mm -hmm. these bands that had hit after hit, it seems to me that Funk's decline would have been mitigated. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And that it has accelerated, perhaps because of the effect of desegregation. Oh, that's, that's an interesting. That's an interesting theory. Okay. Uh, is there any information about what happened then in the church now that there was a certain cycle of the secular music or the opera story? It was there now a dynamic that came back to. Yeah, that's that's a really good question because that's actually where almost all of the uh, musicians uh, that are from Dayton uh, are involved right now. They're all involved in church. Steve Arrington, Steve Arrington is doing gospel music. Um, uh, members, former members of um, uh, the band Zap, are involved in church. Even Roger Troutman. Uh, uh, when he was tragically uh, killed, uh, was doing a lot of gospel projects. So there's a way in which the church ends up reemerging, it, but it's in a different kind of community context. Uh, <clears throat> Dayton is so interesting that when I go to Dayton, the kind of response that I get 
from people who remember what Dayton was versus what you see now uh, is really uh, quite remarkable. People almost can't imagine being talked about, you know, when you look at uh, what's happening now, there's a large uh, portion of urban blight. Um, the schools are in disarray. Um, many of the services are depleted in Dayton today. So um, churches in this context, current context, are one of the last sort of functioning black institutions. Uh, at their heyday, there were just one part. Um, there was a black women's civic organization connected kind of a Jack and Jill-like organization called Twin Tig uh, that bought instruments for people. They worked hand-in-hand -hand with churches, uh, whereas um, music instruction uh, that still exists today is pretty much almost exclusively through the church. That's really all that's left. It might also give, I remember um, music coming out of the, the words for Rack didn't come out consistently at the but the Northeast Ohio Mass Choir. Mm. Um, Thank you. 
repeat in places like Buffalo, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Chicago. produced the Gap Band. Well, I mean, Chicago, but I, I'm more for the cities that, you know, I mean, Chicago already has a lot, you know, let's give, a, let's give something to Tulsa, you know, let's, let's give it to these other, you know, places, you know, do you see what I mean? Um, and so, I think that's, that's absolutely right. I'm interested in, in getting uh, your information and learning more about that, because I'm having trouble theorizing about this because so much of what I'm, I'm gathering comes from, you know, the narr sort of narrative experience. Uh, but as someone who was taught high school, you know, I actually raised the point about um, ideas about teaching the form from all the pressure that was on us to do things like home visits. That was a radical idea, you know, uh, do home visits. And whereas in this ethos, that's not even a question. Right? So how much has the way in which the policy dimension of desegregation thwarted the kind of learning we could have gotten? And that's part of the one directional nature of deseg, the idea that these black educators could have actually informed the predominantly white schools on how to teach as opposed to the other way. Uh, so that's, yeah, that's, that's really where I think some kind of theorizing can uh, as I get into this. But this is just really the early stage of this. Uh, hopefully by this time, maybe next year, I'll have uh, a lot more to share on, on issues like that. Hi, I just wanted to make a, a really <coughs> point touching on that is that um, uh, this very much parallels my experience growing up in the 60s and 70s mm -hmm. in New Haven on the East Coast. And so this kind of community community pedagogy or communal pedagogy mm -hmm. is also not limited to funk. Right. That was very much mm -hmm. the spirit of the time. People did not sit around watch well we watched TV, mm -hmm. but we sat around playing music. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was so much a part of the culture mm -hmm. at the mm -hmm. time and it, I really miss it. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. it's a good, an important conversation to have about all mm -hmm. kinds of music education. Yeah, it, it is. And it's see it's it, the only trouble spot is, you know, to talk about these things and then not make the mistake, you know, that people like Adolf Reed are warning us not to make, and that is to end up producing kind of nostalgic. Yeah. Um, but I, as I sort of talk with students, I mean, there's this this issue of kind of simultaneous um, problematics as well as things that we've lost that can happen in history at the same time. And we usually wed it to an idea of either uh, linear ascension or some kind of decline, loss, and it's usually a mixture. A complicated mixture uh, that I think this story, you know, hopefully captures. Okay. One more. Uh, how do I you don't know how long people? Will how do you receive current musicians slash artists uh, as far as sampling interpolations? Do you see it as a compliment or do you receive it as sort of like a cringing factor? You hate when they like. I, I don't cringe because I think that's the way in which the music ended up um, surviving. Um, a period in which it was sort of pushed to the side. So a lot of people will, a lot of new audiences who didn't uh, live in that era. I'm, I'm, I'm 38. I'm already talking about being, you know, a, a generation apart, right, or two, maybe. Um, and so they hear watching you, and they hear it as something that had been sampled. They hear Patrice Russian, Forget Me Nots, they hear it as Men in Black. Um, and that's not a bad thing because it's also an opportunity to reintroduce new generations. So, so when they hear it played live, my, my issue is that this generation, I don't believe, has seen a, an experienced good live performance. And I, was, I'm, I probably would not have, I was very young and I went to, uh, I went to Prince's first concert when he yeah, opened up for Rick James in Rochester in 79. I've gone to the uh, P-Funk uh, Earth Tour, so I've seen video kill not only the radio star, video kill the live performer. Uh, and so this generation knows nothing about a good show in my, not I shouldn't say know nothing, but I think there are traces of that through, let's say, Outkast. But Outkast does it because they're connected to Cameo. You know, Caroline, all that funk, that's the, you know, Andre doesn't write that. That's by <laughs> Kevin, that's written, look at the credits, Kevin Kendrick keyboard player for Cameo. That's why you get out of ow and all that. That's Atlanta became the site that Cameo migrated to uh, in the 1980s when they reinvented themselves with the word up and really taking on a more sugarfoot-like vocal tone, right? They weren't like that in the 70s, they were, you know. 
So that's where, and that's the continuity that gives me hope. That's why, you know, that's how I keep, I keep the faith through those connections. And groups like The Roots that mix live music. Um, but I, I mean, I like hip hop. I'm, I don't want to say that I'm, 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 I'm not appreciative of hip hop, but I just think that the live performance dimension of it, um, I never could understand people that would pay so much money to watch people walk around on the stage. Um, you see, this is a period in which the live performance was a separate art form. That the extent to which you changed the song up made the show better. You see what I mean? You don't go to a show and expect to hear it like the record. You want to watch the new creation of live music. That's gone now. And I see that when I look at these artists sing live on these award shows, that's the part. And you get old timers up there. I, mean, I think Ohio players will still, or 70-something year old Chuck Brown will still <laughs> take care of a lot of these younger artists. And there's also the ageism, the ageism that has come as a result of the videoization of black music and where it's all about the look. A group like Earth, Wind & Fire, Maurice White's hairline was receding back then. He wouldn't get a deal. They wouldn't get a deal now. Not at all. They would not get signed. Earth, Wind & Fire, if they were the same group they were, not because music has changed, but because the criteria for how we select the corporatization and the selection process is not there. But Earth, Wind & Fire was big first as a college band. They toured college after college after college, and there was a popular demand for them and a process for them to do so. I don't know if that exists now. I certainly would like to be a part of creating it. Yeah. I'm sorry, I started preaching now. Holy defender of the funk and all of that. Yes. Uh, Mark, you got last one. Yeah, I was wondering if you checked out some of like the the kind of, I mean, the sort of East L.A. variant of it. And I'm thinking mm -hmm. of like, you know, bands like uh, War. Yeah. And then yeah. their kind of cultural heirs, which I would say today is mm -hmm. the band uh, also Motley, actually. Yeah, yeah. and I think, well, what, I, what I've done in the class that I taught, uh, Funk Music and Urban History, is I talked about um, a lot of different cities and their distinctive uh, uh, contribution to this music. So I did Seattle. Um, you know, Vallejo with uh, Confunction, Course Sly, uh, War. So there, you know, this, that's why I said this story is transportable. I, I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't want to write an ex a, a Ohio exceptionalism piece. I want to write something that gives us a blueprint for re-examining the period and re-examining urban history and urban culture. Uh, and I think you're absolutely right. Uh, there's a, a Los Angeles story to be told in East L.A. Uh, dimension to that as well. I'm just stop because you all know once I get going on the phone.